just uh, recorded a really great podcast with Phil Janiszewski and Matt Makovich. Um, and it was really interesting to listen to these guys. They have a ton of energy, uh, really awesome. And there's something that uh, we talked about that I just wanted to talk about before the podcast. And it was this idea of saying yes to ourselves and why that's so important. And I feel that there's times in my career, uh, both when I was in a school, when I was a school district, even uh, what I do today, is that I found that I was saying yes to everything else. And then eventually that meant that I would say no to myself. And that would per, you know, compound with health issues, uh, struggle with, with mental health, And I think we have to find those boundaries, as my friend uh, Evan Whitehead would talk about, because a lot of times we, and we want to be in education because we want to help others. We want, you know, the kids to do really well. We want our colleagues to be successful, but also it's okay to want that for ourselves as well. And I, I just wanted to share that before you listen to this podcast and really get you to think about that, especially as we're going into a new school year and you're going into this and it can just be really easy to get in these habits and say yes and we want to and I understand that we want to do a great job we want to make our schools better but we can't do that unless you're okay unless you're doing well and so that idea of saying yes to yourself is something that we talk about in this podcast the importance of like having confidence in our own work and confidence in the work that we do and how that leads to us better serving others and it's not about just saying no to every opportunity but really you say yes to yourself so you can be better for other people so you can be okay with yourself and we talk about that we talk about the importance of confidence and we right off the top get into debate about chicago deep dish pizza it was a fun podcast. I really enjoyed talking to both these guys. I know you're going to enjoy it. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I actually have uh, two guys that I met years ago that we just talked about this. Uh, are you just waving at me? Is that what's going on? Stop he has it. a fly in his basement. <laughs> so, going. so Stop we got it. we got Matt Makovich, who is currently a guidance counselor in the Chicagoland area, and that's like that's you say Chicagoland area if you don't know the specific area. That's like the trick, right? And for then, sure, yeah. And then, Phil- and then people will believe you, even if you don't work there. You're like, oh, <laughs> right. I'm in the Chicagoland area. Oh, great, yeah, that's wonderful, great like, area. We're gonna actually because you're both in Chicagoland area. We're gonna there's a hot topic I want to talk about right at the beginning, um, mm. and then you know it's gonna be about Phil, Phil, Phil Janosuski, and uh, both of them. And Phil is actually currently uh, a, a high school science teacher, which was easily my worst subject in school. And so I'm excited both uh, to speak to both of you. you. You're both are speakers, but before we get to li- know a little bit about you. Uh, tell me about Chicago deep dish pizza and why it's terrible. Well, George, oh, wow. let, me, let me, let me just kick this off right now. I'm going to get a lot of hometown heat for this. But Is it I bad? Would, well, I would gladly take a thin <laughs> crust over a deep dish any day of the week. Oh, Anytime controversy I have immediately. To eat a pizza with a fork and a knife, George, oh. save it. Too much work. Wow. Go ahead, Phil. If Cheers. I, I want to hear your uh, opinion interject on this. here. First of all, being a two-time Chicago pizza tour survivor, <laughs> I've learned that the deep dish is not the most purchased pizza in Chicago. It's just what Chicago is known for. The most really? purchased pizza in Chicago is a thin crust pepperoni. However, I would happy happily take deep dish any day, but I'll take thin crust as well. As long as you don't fold it, then everything's fine. <laughs> okay, so I got I got I, I had to talk about this right away because I have a very, uh, there's a viewpoint that I have on this, right? So I remember I was working at a school district and they said, hey, we're going to have pizza for lunch. I'm like, I love pizza. Pizza's my favorite. And they bring Chicago deep dish. I'm like, what? I don't want this. And I eat it. I'm like, this is gross, right? So the thing is, was it gross or was I expecting what I'm used to for pizza? Because Mm -hmm. once then, I remember actually later eating Chicago deep dish, understanding what that meant and what it actually looked like. 
And then I was like, okay, now I like this, but it's because I'm expecting it, right? I don't know if that, like, I, I don't know if that throws people off. And there's no, actually George, that makes sense because there's nights where, let's say, you're with the family. Hey, I got a taste for pizza. Sure, you do, but it's two <laughs> different tastes for pizza. It's right. either a thin crust taste or a deep dish taste. They're two. I feel like it's you disagree, but well, there's just there's a reason why the deep dish is the way it is. You got to put the red sauce on top, or the cheese would burn. It's too thick. It takes a long time to cook, guys. It it's does. just it's just science. There's no way around it. So, so George, bring it now that we bring lost it about twenty five percent of your population bring, of listeners. No, if you bring in uh, pizza, I got I got a whole I got a whole new crew. That's what happened, right? <laughs> and now they're going to be like, oh, this happens to be now. I'm more interested in you know public education. It's a pizza. So so I there, there's actually do you do you guys know AJ Giuliani? Do you know him? So AJ Giuliani, he's a he's a speaker friend of mine. Uh, I've known him for years, and he came to visit me in Edmonton. And there's, I said, oh, I'm gonna take you to this place. Uh, it was this pizza place. We we're looking for something to eat, and it's literally called Chicago Deep Dish Pizza. And it is like not Chicago Deep Dish Pizza. It's just like pizza with a lot of meat on it, and that's it. Mm-hmm. Like so. So then he's like, this is not. I'm like, it's just called that. So like when I went there, I'm like, oh, this is going to be like that place in Edmonton. And then it was like, that's, I think that's what threw me off. But I just had to, I had to get that out there. Right. And so we'll see who the hardcore innovators mindset podcast listeners are, if they stuck with us after this, but I had to be, you know, having two guys from the Chicago area, I had to get your, your take on that right away. I usually would save that to the end, but pizza is pretty big in my house. So sure. that's a, that's a big Understood, thing. George. So Matt, I Matt, mean- <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I make a great deep dish. Next time you're in town, I'd be happy to make you one. I'm in. I'm in. So, Matt, t- talk a little bit about uh, who you are and a little bit about your educational journey. For sure, George. Well, my name is Matthew Makovich, 35 years old, uh, born and raised southwest side of Chicago. So uh, my, my parents still live in my childhood home. We're just a few blocks uh, west of Midway Airport. So grew up here in those plains every single day. Absolutely mm. loved my childhood. Uh, my mom was a special education teacher for about 35 years. So she really uh, gave me the education bug. And then um, I went on to attend Nazareth Academy for high school, went to Elmhurst College, and then went on to Lewis University to get my master's degree. And uh, throughout that whole process, I happened to cross paths with my, my dear buddy Phil here. And then uh, a whole new chapter started in terms of creativity and fun and i'm excited to talk about it and that's a, that's actually pretty cool because um the like you're still your 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 family is in education you still live close to them too right and Correct, so yes so that that that's pretty you know because uh my uh family's uh perspective like my parents are not educators they actually my dad had a grade two education mom had grade six education both came to canada you know as they're younger they saw um education is, is really important and uh, I remember actually one of my students, he connected me on Facebook and uh, he, he said to me, he said, I, I just got to ask you a question. This is, this is literally my first class. I taught grade four, my first year of teaching. He said, so you went to kindergarten, grade 12 nonstop. Then you went to university and you think, I think you said for six years. I'm like, yeah. And then he said, you did all that. So you could go back to school. Like, why would you do that? Right. <laughs> and and, it, and it, like I just thought it was hilarious the way he asked that because like he had no interest in being a teacher but I actually um it's interesting how my parents have you know had a perspective on like education is everything because we didn't get it and that's why I went in and I think there's people like that and then you have people that you know grew up in the profession and it's kind of interesting you know kind of the takes on that so uh that's that's pretty cool that you're you know still close to your family I know family is very important to me so I, I appreciate you sharing that and Phil uh, a little bit about your education journey so tell us about like where you started from and what you're doing now yeah, I'm Phil Janiszewski, 38 years old, grew up in the southwest suburbs, so I was never Chicago boy. I would be faking it till I make it if I said I was a true Chicago boy. I was just outside 25 minutes out, but grew up in a great family, uh, valued education. No one was an educator in my family, mm-hmm. so definitely when I took that switch, they may have thought that sounded weird. My whole life, I wanted to go into culinary arts. I thought I wanted to cook found out at about 17 years old that I hated doing it as a job. I loved doing it for like my family and being with people was really close with my chemistry teacher, a really cool down to earth guy that just seemed to accept us for who we were. Mm -hmm. I went and told him, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I just realized I don't not want to cook. And he said, you have tons of school spirit. I said, yeah, I love, I love being Mm -hmm. here. I love people. He said, uh, you seem to like science. And I said, yeah, I do. I really enjoy your class. I like science a lot. 
He's like, why don't you be in high school the rest of your life? Why don't, why don't you teach? If this is your place, why don't you make it your job? Mm -hmm. And I said, holy smokes, I, that, that's it. That's, that's it. And I talked to a gentleman I mentioned talking earlier. His name was Lee Harsey. I uh, had a guidance and I knew him well and was talking about how I was nervous and that maybe everything I thought I wanted to do wasn't panning out. And he full wholeheartedly agreed, pointed out the steps to get to be a teacher. And there I was. I've been teaching chemistry, physics, and physical science. This will be my 17th year coming up. And about eight years ago, I ended up getting stuck with this clown next to me at a leadership conference saying we got an hour to fill and we got no money to pay for anybody. Anybody got something to say? They matched us up. We really? took it super seriously, had a great time, tons of laughs, love to entertain, love comedy, and have similar views even though we grew up in different homes. And uh, from there, it turned into this amazing journey that has made our lives better, and uh, we've met so many awesome people because of it. So it's crazy how paths can – pivot and change and lead you to exactly where you need to be. So how did, how did you, how did you got paired up? Like tell, tell us a little bit more about that. You, you <laughs> just, like, they just said, Hey, we got two random people. Let's see if they can present. Like, how did that go? So at this, uh, at this conference that we're asking yeah. for current staff members who would be interested in just maybe giving a little talk or okay. a presentation. So at that time, my hand went up, Phil hand, Phil's hand went up. We, we barely knew each other, but we knew like, Hey, let's do something different. So I'll never forget. He came over to my house. We sat down at my kitchen table. Literally hours go by. We're drawing up ideas. We're drawing up, a, you know, just different wow. visions that each of us had after years of going to this conference and figuring out exactly what do speakers talk about? What do students want to hear? What do students need to hear? And literally, we just created this monster. It was back in February or January, actually, of 2013 when our planning started. And then here we are in 2021. And We've mm -hmm. had the pleasure of just going across the country. It's nuts how it happened, but it was uh, <laughs> quite the wild ride when when this baby was born, and and I feel like uh, it's only growing quicker and, and better than ever. That's awesome. And like I we we I think I briefly mentioned this. Like I was at your school district years ago, and yes. uh, I, I I spoke there, and that's how we first kind of all connected. And when I remember earlier in my career, um, like I just saw people on stage and I'm like, ah, that'd be really cool. Like I, I would like to do that. And, uh, and, but that was it. Like that was like, it was just like, kind of like in that moment, it was cool. Like I never thought about it the next day. It wasn't something. And I remember, uh, sharing some of the stuff that I was doing in my school and people were like, Hey, you want to come speak at my school? I'm like, what, what are you talking about? And I was like, Oh, that's like, that's an actual thing. Like I had no clue. Right. And sure. obviously, you know, it's, 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 being an impact and it's kind of neat to kind of see your progression and um, all the work that you're doing. So like over the last, you know, it, like I, I keep wanting to say 2020 cause it feels like it's just been the longest year ever. Do you know what I mean? I feel like it's just one <laughs> mess up of a year. I don't know. If, I don't know if that's just me. Cause I like, I still feel like we're not out of 2020. I don't know, but we're like also locked down in Alberta right now while we're recording this. So maybe a little bit different. Um, so like over this last year, like what, what has been your message to, educators like what what have you been focusing on um you know at, at this time yeah basically our for us it's been trying to control what's in our control mm -hmm. for sure so for a lot of our message has been always uh we're, we like to say we're cultivators of confidence so we think that confidence initially is the foundation of everything when we're self-confident we're willing to take better care of ourselves you know we know you lost all that weight in that and <laughs> yeah. have really taken a huge control of your life again, right? It's a, it's a different feeling. So we talk about how being confident in yourself means that you'll treat yourself well for personal health. It'll, uh, it'll be, you're more likely to jump on opportunities. You're more likely to make those changes because you have the energy to do so. So we've been promoting a lot of what we call unstoppable, just what is in our control right now that we can do to make a situation, like as you said, that mm -hmm. isn't particularly pleasant or amazing right now, right. but what can we do to try to make the best possible outcome? And as Matt shares a lot of the audiences, if we are in this time of transition or waiting, can we do anything now so that when this is all done, we are better than ever mm -hmm. that we've been, you know, like, is this a time to pause and take advantage of it? Even though a lot of what we wanted to happen isn't happening, you know, perspective change, mm -hmm. which is like what you just did, George, you lost all that weight. You got into best, you know, some of the best physical shape that maybe you've ever been in. And it's because you controlled what was in your control during a time when there were so many things out of our reach. 
Yeah, like I, I like the that concept because I, I think when you're talking about how it leads, um, like having some of that control, having some of that confidence, uh, you know, there's I, I shared this a long time ago talking about how really important it is to have like confident leaders, right? And when I say that, there's like there's I, I kind of share this continuum where there's like it's there's confidence and then there's insecurity and then there's arrogance, right? So a lot of times when I don't know things and I'm uncomfortable with that stuff, uh, then I start you know saying like no, you shouldn't do that, don't do this, don't do this because it makes me feel insecure that you're uh, maybe excelling past me. You you know things that I don't know, and then you have that. Whereas like if you're confident, you're like hey no, like I hired you. You know, you're on my team. Like that's that's why I hired you is because you are mm-hmm. doing that right. And then arrogance is like, you know, hey Matt, Phil, that's a stupid idea, right? Like and just putting people <laughs> down, right? And that confidence mm-hmm. would be like, hey, that's that's awesome. Like I want these people to actually leave better, you know, when, than when they came into. And I, I find that like a lot of people see the notion, that, and I would love your thoughts on this, is that self confidence is kind of rooted in like a narcissism. Whereas I find, you know, when I actually take get better care of myself when I have that, it actually helps me deal with others better. Cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's basically the foundation of everything mm-hmm. that we speak on. And we always tell our audiences too, that, I mean, uh, too much self-confidence, like you're saying, could lead or right. be interpreted as arrogance, but yeah. we always say self-confidence should always be balanced out with gratitude. And if you continue to stay grateful for what you have, how you got there, give appreciation to those who helped you get there. Right. Those are all of the things that help kind of keep you balanced as a self-confident individual. What else would you say, Phil? Yeah. I just think you guys are hitting it on the head. Once you do have that foundation, I just think you, when I know that when I'm well rested and I'm Mm -hmm. eating well, when I step into my classroom, you know, I'm more patient, I'm more fun, I'm more energetic. I'm not, I'm not dragging my feet, picking something up, you know, I'm just more animated in that. And I'm giving more of myself to my students, which in turn is hopefully going to get them to be more plugged in to Mm -hmm. what we're doing. So I think that as we talk about this a lot too, Matt, as fathers and as husbands and as family members, when I'm feeling my best, I can give my best to my family too, you know, Mm -hmm. instead of trying to maybe without even realizing it, avoid the, what we consider work when we're tired is really just void opportunities to connect with my children, connect with my, my wife and Mm -hmm. that. So, I mean, that this took kind of a physical health and mental health kind of spin to it. But we, and we do touch on that when we present, but confidence too is getting over those insecurities. Mm -hmm. And we always talk about the best way to do that is to experience and to take healthy risks. And I think that's the best part of what we enjoy doing in our presentations is that, as you know, George, we already talked about, we're huge in Mm self-deprecation and having fun. We're not standing up there saying, you know, this is who you need to be us. We're saying we're, we're, we're a little bit of a hot mess and we're learning as we go, (laughs) but we bring people up and put them into strange situations where it's comical funny but in the end they become the stars of the presentation right the show people are laughing people are cheering for them and all of a sudden they get that that energy like holy smokes i just did that in front of 300 strangers and though that was weird and awkward i feel mm-hmm. so empowered right now and then we talk about that was maybe dumb what we had you do that was silly right but there was actually a big point it's when you do try new things and grow a little bit it empowers you and energizes you to do that even more and then you're more willing to as you get older take healthy risks try new opportunities put yourself out there jump on things and i think that's a more fulfilling life yeah, like one of the one of the things, uh, and I like I really appreciate just sitting down and chatting with you both. Is I have always incur- like some people say like, "Hey, I want to do the work that you're doing, George." I'm like, "Okay, so you gotta like blog for like years. You gotta, you know, do this. You gotta do this." And they're like, "No, I just want to get to the po- that like that point, right?" And I'm still growing. I'm still getting better. And and what I've seen some people do, and is that they're just saying like here's, I'm the best at this. I, you know, I rule at this, blah, blah, blah. And that to me is kind of pushes people away. And maybe, maybe not, maybe, maybe it's me that it pushes away. What I appreciate about both of you too is, is that, um, the humility and like, I have gone, like, I hate when anyone refers to me as an expert. like, Oh, George is like an expert of innovation. Like who said that? I did, I never said that. Nobody like you might okay. You might think that, but where are you getting that from? Because I no one's ever. I, I didn't go to expert school. I don't have any of that stuff, right? 
all I'm doing is sharing my learning as I go. And I think yeah. that's, I think this is a message for anybody, um, you know, that wants to do the work that you two are doing is that really, it's not about you have to be the, the best at something or, you know, we were kind of talking about this before the podcast, like none of us have achieved, like none of us have like Olympic medals unless, you know, maybe mm-hmm. you, it's a surprise <laughs> medal. I don't know about <laughs> Right. No, but it's no, just like you, you, no, you, you both, you both have just, record. you both have just shared your learning and people connect with that. Right. And so like, is mm-hmm. it, is that something, you know, that you focused on? Is it, was it just, you know, second nature to you? Like, wh- how did it get to that process? Because that to me is like, I, I, I don't need the perfection. I need, I need to see the process. I need to see like where you're at, what you're thinking is how it's changed. And when we first sat down and, and started putting an outline together, uh, the first thing Phil and I spoke about was we have to be transparent and genuine mm-hmm. with our audience about embarrassing or awkward moments that we faced when we were their age, when we were in middle school, when we were in high school. So then that's how we really try to kick things off just to build that level of relatability. Like, oh, this guy pitted out at a high school dance. This guy got stood up by a girl. This guy once told, got told that his arms were too puny right. because he ran cross country all those things, but we like to put it out there just so people get a better understanding of who we are and what we're all about. And I mean, we run our speaking company like a mom and pop shop. So like Mm -hmm. when people say to us, how did you guys get started? How do we get there? How do we do it? And we have to remind them, you know, every t-shirt that's designed, every email that's sent, every social media post, it it comes from either Phil or I, and that's, you know, something we take great pride in. Yeah. I also like to, I think just talking about all that, we always said that everything we do has to be lighthearted because that's who we are. Like we're never the person coming in trying to get people crying, uh, sobbing and like on their knees. We want people energized and like boosted and laughing. And we think laughter is a great medicine. So when we're talking about these awkward and strange moments that innocently happened to us in high school, it's not like the, hey, feel sorry for me. This is bad. It's like, man, that was weird. You know, did you, (laughs) did anything weird ever happen to you? You know, kind of stuff. And I think that's more inviting to people. It's not like uh, we're, we, we always like to say, you know, like the ordinary is extraordinary. Right. Life is full of strange, awkward moments. And the more comfortable we are with ourselves, the quicker we're going to brush that off and say, man, that was weird. Whatever. Laugh it off and go do something else, you know, and right. don't, don't dwell on it. Right. Feel it. But then, you know, let, let it go. So because we do that and we get to be lighthearted, we like to say that we're like the fun uncles. <laughs> we kind of show up at events like, hey, all right, you know, let's learn a bit. Let's have some fun. But Matt and I absolutely love to entertain. We love for people to laugh. And honestly, I think the message of the whole presentation seems to always come afterwards. Right. After they think back to, man, that was weird. Why, what, you know, why did that happen? Why was this person doing a bird mating call? Why was this person taking a baby doll and trying to sing it? to sleep you know what why was that why were they doing a ribbon dance to a terrible song Mm -hmm. but by by doing those strange things at first we could look like total clowns absolutely but but when people really dig into it they realize there's actually a powerful message a lot of people are afraid of growing and taking healthy risks because they're afraid of that failure or they're afraid of embarrassing themselves so we we embarrass them for them and then they get over it as a as a as a podcast host i i feel that i'd be remiss if i didn't dig in why are you doing bird mating calls? Oh, like that's well, a great question. Yeah, it is. A, yeah, I think yeah. it is a great question because I'm like, there's a lot of why are they doing bird that's, mating calls? I'm like, why are you doing bird mating calls? Well, it's a it's a segment of our presentation that we like to call the awkward Olympics. And what <laughs> we do is we try to empower our audience not by way of lecture but by way of taking a healthy risk. Right. So we'll get three unsuspecting volunteers <laughs> up on stage, and then we present them with the activity that they're doing. So when we Love ask it. for a volunteer, every hand in the place goes up, and then as soon as they come up there, they're like. <laughs> Oh, what did I just sign up for? Right. So in comes the bird mating call. <laughs> in comes the dance with the mannequin. I mean, uh, you name it, George. And it's it's empowering. Mm-hmm. And, and we say that we're like air traffic control yeah. where we get those planes up in the air and we let the audience take care of the rest. They create their own energy, empower themselves. They become legendary at their school and we just slowly drift into the backdrop. So it's it's a very, very cool moment to be a part of. There's a, there's a, a, a saying, and I try to really think about it in the context of what I've been doing for years. And it's take the work seriously, but not yourself too seriously. Mm. Right. And I think mm-hmm. I kind of emulate that. And I remember actually 
And I'm going to ask you about this, like how, how, how all this applies. Cause I know a lot of educators listen to this that, you know, have maybe don't want to be speakers. Don't want to go into that, but you know, like how does this apply to the work that we do in the classroom? And I remember, um, my first couple of years I was, uh, you know, I would go home like bawling and, you know, like, I can't believe that kid talked back to me. Right. Like it was just like, took it so personally whenever there was something wrong in the classroom. Right. And, uh, I, this is one of these, like, there's a couple of times I can point to like, oh, I remember this moment, everything changed with my perspective of that. And one of them was, I was, I went to a new school district and they had a speaker and, uh, and the speaker just said something I'll never forget. He said, never let a 12 year old ruin your day. I was like, that's, I'm, I'm doing that all the time. Like I'm, I'm like totally letting 12 year olds like, and I'm not like not letting 12 year olds ruin my day. Like a 12 year old, like this one kid said that I took it personally. Like, why does this kid hate me? Like, what have I done wrong? I'm like, ah, no, that's actually not, that's not a me thing right now. That's something that kid's dealing with. That's something what's going on with the kid. I actually didn't do anything right. Like when I do something, <laughs> I can apologize. That kid's taking it out. Just like sometimes I would, you know, and we were talking about this before, uh, Phil, when, when I was like in science, uh, I was, I, I struggle with science. I still, to this day, I, I struggle with science and I think it's science is really important. I think it's crucial, but I think there's other people who should do it. And there's things that I'm really good at. And that's how I, I believe it. But if, if like for a lot of science teachers, I was their worst nightmare because I did not want to be seen stupid. So I'm like, I'm going to go class clown. I'm, I'm going full class clown. I'm going to be disruptive in class. And in fact, the more I can disrupt class and not, we don't have to do science, then no one will know. Right. And so when you, like, I think that kind of emulates that idea of like, you know, really not taking ourselves too seriously, but you know, the work is important work that we do in education. So like, how does this message resonate to what we do with kids in the classroom? Yeah. And, and I, I could kick it off by saying, um, it's, it's easy, no matter what line of work you're in, is, is to take that nine to five to heart and take it extremely serious. Mm-hmm. I have learned through over my years in my current profession that you take yourself less seriously during the day if you have enough creative passion and purpose after your work day ends. So knowing that, you know, when you're at home, you're becoming a better version of yourself mm-hmm. by exercise, fitness, nutrition, having creative outlets outside of that nine to five.